I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. I've been wanting to talk to someone about psychoactive plants for some time and it took me a while to track down a guest who could talk with authority on the subject which I eventually did with the very kind help of Lewis from the Ethnobotanical Assembly. If you don't already know, the Ethnobotanical Assembly is a quarterly online magazine for research, writing and thinking about people-plant relationships. It's free to view, it's beautiful and it opens up conversations around plants you may never have considered before, so I urge you to visit their website which I've linked to in the show notes. Once Lewis had given me the name Glenn Shepherd. I got in touch with Glenn and he was more than happy to chat to me but he's a busy busy man and has been travelling between Europe and Brazil and between me messing up phone call appointments due to time zones and him zipping about it took a while to make the call but it was more than worth the wait and of course by the time I chatted to him the devastating fires had taken hold across the Amazon forest so I was able to ask him about his experiences and get the view on the ground from Glenn who lives right on the edge of the forest itself. Glenn leads a fascinating life. To me, he's like a real-life movie character. Although I wanted to talk specifically about psychoactive plants, I also wanted to find out a little bit more about what led him to be living and working in Brazil alongside the indigenous people of the Amazon forest. I mean, I've lived in Brazil for 20 years, and uh, I've done a number of different projects with different different peoples. My first project in Brazil was actually on the Upper Rio Negro with the Baniwa people. And they were um, they were just beginning to sell their traditional basketry in big into big uh, shopping department department stores in São Paulo and Rio. They developed this project where they were they were buying they were they were the the, in, the indigenous artisans were making the baskets um, in their villages and then they were transporting them out to Rio, São Paulo, even to Europe, and selling them for value added uh, uh, economic development. But the people who were buying the baskets started asking questions. Well, where are these? What is this made of? Are we chopping down the Amazon rainforest to, to make these baskets? And so I had just arrived in Brazil, and they 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 heard that I was an ethnobotanist, and they said, "Would you help us um, evaluate the what plants they what what are the species of plants that they're using, and what is the impact on the environment of harvesting these plants?" So I put together a project with the, the – it was actually the Baniwa Indigenous Peoples Federation invited me to do the research. Usually, as ethnobotanists, we come up with a project and go out and ask the Indians, can I do this project? This was the other way around. They actually invited me. We want you to do this project. And so that was my first project in Brazil, um, You know, identifying the plants involved. As usual with indigenous uh, crafts, it's not just one plant. There's four or five different species of the fiber plant, and there's a whole bunch of different species used as colors and dyes and fixers. And so in the end, it turned out to be this very rich, you know, 15 or 20 plant species. And um, and because the, the the fiber plants that they use um, to make this these baskets, they actually grow in old garden sites. So it's almost as though the, the basketry is like a byproduct of their agriculture. So it's actually very, very sustainable because the plants that they use to make the baskets grow in their gardens. So it, it turned out to be a very, it was very easy to sustain their, their, their production of these, of these baskets, these, these uh, fibers. It's sort of like a, it's like arrowroot. It's the arrowroot family. It's called aruma. And, and so, so that was my first experience in Brazil. And it was a, you know, a, a, a piece of work where I was actually called upon by the indigenous peoples to do work that was in, in their interest. Yeah. And and how much work have you been doing with the um, psychoactive plants? Did that lead on from there? The When I got to Brazil, in, in the year 2000, there was a big international scandal where there was, a, um, there was a, a Swiss pharmaceutical company that had negotiated with the government of Amazon State to basically get exclusive rights to all of the state of Amazonas's biodiversity for 20 years, something like that, for a very small price. And it led the Brazilian government to denounce it as biopiracy. And so for the first 10 years I was in Brazil, they sort of shut down research. It was very hard to get research on, on, on plants. So I kind of the, – the, the question of medicinal plants became very, very, uh, very, very 
um, taboo in Brazil from 2000 to about 2010. So I kind of, I stopped working so much with the medicinal plants in Brazil and just continued on my research in Peru. You know, the, the research I'd already done just continued publishing and analyzing that data because it became sort of, in Brazil, it became a little bit tricky uh, to work with, with traditional plant knowledge and indigenous peoples were very suspicious of, uh, of biopiracy. So mm -hmm. I kind of I continued that work at a, sort of at a distance, and and the, the work that I started in Peru, I sort of continued publishing and analyzing that data. Do they have a problem with um, with the seeds as well, seed sovereignty? I mean, you in Brazil, you you have to be very careful with, with you know collecting plants, taking plants out of the country. There's very strict laws about the you know Brazil was, I mean, um, Brazil has a has a big chip on their shoulder because of course. Um, the English botanist, uh, I think his name was Henry Wickman, took rubber seeds from Brazil, smuggled them out of Brazil, and took them to Indochina, to uh, to Malaysia, to the rubber plantations. And they and and so the the collapse of the rubber room was caused by an English ethno an English botanist who sort of snuck the seeds out. So Brazil is very uh, sensitive about about biopiracy for a good reason. You can understand it, but I think I think they've sort of they sort of went to a far extreme, and so. You know, whereas India and China, also countries with extremely rich biodiversity and incredibly advanced medicinal plant, traditional medicinal plant medicine, in those countries, the the, the scientific institutions in the countries have facilitated research. And you know, in India and China, and elsewhere in Southeast Asia, you have this huge um, uh, this huge industry of developing, patenting, developing new medicines from plant. Whereas in Brazil, this time frame sort of late 90s to about 2010 it was all kind of shut down because of these really strict laws and and it's almost as though brazil sort of missed the boat because now the drug companies have really moved away from natural products they they're looking more into you know gene therapy and and they do 3d modeling of drugs they sort of know what their target molecule looks like and they model it and so there, there was an opportunity i think from the from the 1990s, early 2000s, to really develop some interesting drugs from mm. rainforest plants, and there was all that. You know, there's all the there's all the big news in the in the oh, the, the Amazon could save the planet. There's all these great drugs out there, and Brazil and other South American countries sort of the excessive paranoia made them clamp down so tight on research that not not a whole lot of research was done, which was, I think it was sort of a missed opportunity. So you're talking about medicinal plants, um, and I right. was wanting to talk about the psychoactive plants. Um, sure. Are they classed as medicinal plants? Yes. I mean, I mean, for, for, for the different Amazonian peoples that I've worked with, and I've worked with several different groups um, who use psychoactive plants, the, the, the psychoactive plants are they always have a medicinal use in addition to their psychoactive use, almost always. And they're considered to be medicines in and of themselves, shamanic medicines. So you have things like ayahuasca, um, you have things like um, ebena or um, uh, the, 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 you know, the snuff, burola snuff, ebena in, in the upper, you know, in, in northwest Amazon. You have ayahuasca in the western Amazon. And they are considered to be in and of themselves medicines that shamans use to diagnose illness. So they're, they're, they're never used sort of for recreational purposes. They're always used um, in a healing context. Okay. So could that be um, a, an issue that somebody might have with their, with their body? Or would they also treat them for anything to do with the mind? Well, I mean, the way they think of it, it's not so much... We, so, we sort of divide things body-mind. And with, with the indigenous peoples of, of the Amazon that I've worked with, that's not the main distinction, body, mind, psychiatric, you know, physical illness. Sometimes things that we can, we would consider to be a physical illness, uh, like, I don't know, someone has severe diarrhea or vomiting, they sometimes interpret that as being the, the, re, the revenge of an animal, like a, uh, an animal. You would go out and hunt an animal, um, and by hunting the animal, you offend the animal spirit. And the animal will come back and then attack your child, and your child will get diarrhea or vomiting or something like that. And so, even something that we as Westerners would consider to be a physical illness, like vomiting, diarrhea, can have a spiritual, um, a spiritual underpinning. And so, I, and so, the, 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 the distinction that they make when they're talking about whether they're going to go to a shaman, or whether they're going to take an herb, or whether they're going to go to the health post. I mean, because these people live, you know, most indigenous peoples today of the Amazon have contact with Western medicine and because the fact that they ha that they are in contact with Western medicine doesn't mean that either herbal medicine or shamanic medicine dies out. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, they'll what they'll say is, you get a headache or you get a some sort of scratching illness on your body or you get diarrhea or you get really skinny and you go to the health post and you take medicines you don't get better and you go to, you try some herbs and you take those and you don't get better and, and in fact you get worse and they say when that happens you know that there's a there's an underlying spiritual component whether that's witchcraft someone someone's envious you envious has 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 cast a spell or whether there's some animal spirit or forest spirit that's attacking you so the the diagnostic criteria is it's not a mind, it's not like a mental illness or a bodily illness. It's an illness that doesn't get better when you do the normal um, treatment methods. And then you know there's something underlying it. There's something inside you that needs to be removed that only shaman can remove it. And that can be anything from uh, a spine. They'll, they'll, they'll say that you know some, some animal spirit or some forest spirit has embedded a spine into you. And that it's like a hidden spine somewhere in your body. And the shaman has to suck the spine out. Or sometimes it can be... Um, They'll say someone was envious of you because you didn't uh, share antibiotic lotion with them. They needed antibiotic lotion. You didn't share it with them, and they'll bewitch you. And then the, the shaman can go and he'll take his plants and go into trance, and then he'll pull out a little bo- bottle of uh, a little a little tube of antibiotic lotion from your body, and that's the cause of the of the pain that you're feeling. So when we um, there's obviously there's more of an interest in in this kind of thing in the West now. Um, I was speaking to somebody a couple of days ago who'd been on a retreat in the UK uh, with a Brazilian tribe, and he had taken ayahuasca, but are we in the West using these things in a completely different way to what they're intended? It, it sounds as if we are. It sounds as if we're using them for a kind of spiritual experience, whereas actually it's more from a medicinal point of view for the people, the indigenous people. I mean, ayahuasca has, you know, 50 years ago, we didn't even know what the botanical, 50, 60 years ago, we didn't know what the botanical identity of ayahuasca was. There's still, you know, Richard Schultes is the one who finally figured out the 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 composition of the brew, you know, mixing two different plants. So it's a very mysterious plant. And then over the past you know, 50 years, there's been this incredible, um, the incredible international expansion where now ayahuasca is probably taken in every big city in the world. There's probably an ayahuasca ceremony once a week. It's just, it's gone everywhere. And with that expansion, of course, the use has changed. I mean, and I mean, some people will say it's been corrupted, but I would say that the that the uses have been adapted to a different setting. And really, when when indigenous shamanism in in its really traditional context, it's much about hunting. Actually, it is about healing because among the Machiginga people where I work in Peru, um, every rainy season they take ayahuasca once a week or twice a week, and they say, "Why take ayahuasca? I'm taking ayahuasca to be a better hunter because." Being a good when you can't hunt, that is like a sickness. When when people lose their ability to hunt, um, they, they 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 shoot their arrows and they miss the animal, or they go in the end where they don't even see the animal. That needs they need to purify their body. They need they say that the, as you hunt an animal and then you don't cook it properly, or if you waste the meat, and the animal, your your body gets the smell. It's like if you if you 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 cook an animal and and burn the meat. Or you let the pot boil over, then what that means is that you've wasted the meat of that animal. And so the an- you go into the woods and the animal smells you as if you're a vulture full of carrion. And the animal says, "I won't go near that guy. He's just gonna he's gonna waste my meat." And so the uh, the 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 traditional traditional use of ayahuasca among the Machiginga is really as much about hunting. You take ayahuasca, you purge your body of this. You vomit, obviously, mm-hmm. and by vomiting, you get rid of this carrion odor that's accumulated in your body from you know not. From, from not following the taboo, from not following the, the you know, from, from violating food taboos or from wasting meat or from um, for killing an animal and the animal goes off in the woods and dies and you don't recover it. All those things fill your body with this, this rancid smell of rotten meat. And so by taking ayahuasca and throwing up all that stuff, you purify your body. And when you go out in the woods, you see animals and hunt animals. So, so not being able to hunt is an illness in of itself. And so, and then, and then also ayahuasca is used on occasion for curing people who are sick, but it's really much, it's much about hunting. And, 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 and then the curing, um, ayahuasca curing also, often involves healing of either witchcraft illness where someone has bewitched, you know, someone who's been envious will bewitch you or there's some spirit in the forest that attacks you. And so, so there's almost an element of warfare. There's, you know, the shaman is sort of protecting the patient from all of these from vengeful animals or from envious humans. And so there's a whole sort of element of, of, 
uh, attack and revenge warfare going on in Amazonian healing. And of course, when you when ayahuasca goes out into the West, people are using ayahuasca to treat, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, to to delve into childhood trauma, to overcome, you know, uh, psychological illnesses, to overcome, you know, uh, hangups, and so. That has that has very little to do with the origins of its use, and so the so there are some contradictions, and uh, and I think there's some problems in the way it's it's being used because because it's so different than it, I mean so and so I'm doing traditional ayahuasca ayahuasca shamanic treat to treat childhood trauma. Well, no one in the Amazon takes ayahuasca to treat childhood trauma. They they, they take it for other things, but I I don't I don't think these uses are illegitimate. I think they're just they're different, and I think it's important to recognize that um, that these, you know, that these indigenous ways have been adapted and changed to to meet. I mean, in, in a sense, indigenous shamans sort of cater. It, it's become a, a business model. I mean, the Indian people, indigenous people, know that Western people want to come and take ayahuasca, so they they create a setting that's more comfortable for Western people. They create methods. You know, you, you have to pay for it, so it's it's changed a lot from its its uh, traditional origins. But I wouldn't say that it's not legitimate. I think it's just it's different. And are there any implications for indigenous people if this, you know, becomes more widespread, or um, uh, you know, if it? I don't know what the kind of legal implications might be. Um, can you see it causing any problems on that front? For sure. I mean, one, I mean, one problem is just indigenous people's rights. I mean, you know, in, indigenous communities can sometimes, you know, they can have problems with. They can be poor. They can have poor health. They can have, you know. Not very good services, not good education, and this knowledge is sort of taken out of that context with no real benefits and returns to them, and goes into the West and falls into the hands of, you know, some people who might be, you know, legitimate, sincere healers, and some people who might be charlatans selling it to the highest bidder. And so the the a group of Colombian ayahuasca healers um, produced a set of documents. There were there were Americans going to Colombia. Or foreigners, like Europeans, Americans, going to Colombia, claiming to be traditional healers, and they said, "No, that knowledge, you know, only we can confer that, you know, that title onto people." And, and I guess they can't prohibit people from using ayahuasca, but they want to take control over those who claim to be true indigenous healers. So that's one, you know, one one element of it is, what do you call that? Um, um, what do you call it? Sort of. Taking advantage of indigenous knowledge. Yeah, it's exploitative, um, I suppose. Yeah. No, there's another word for it. Um, um, sort of taking over that that oh, cultural appro- heritage. Oh, appropriating. Appro- yeah, yeah, appropriation, but, but but appropriating without any return. So that's one danger. Another danger is, is um, you know, just there was a very famous, notorious case of a researcher who went to Ecuador and tried to patent. I mean, he actually did patent the ayahuasca vine, the, uh, the ayahuasca mixture. Um, he went, used, worked with some indigenous Ecuadorians, and then came out and patented the vine. He didn't end up making a product out of it, but he did successfully patent the vine. I mean, the mixture, and you know, that's a, that's obviously very problematic. Mm. Take something that's been used for you know hundreds, maybe thousands of years, and someone to come in and patent it and claim that they have the right to use that. So that's another another danger. And then there's also the danger of over exploitation because you know ayahuasca is now. Uh, it's a, it's it's in some places in the Amazon, it's harvested commercially, and you know they they harvest it, they boil it down to the to the to the most concentrated possible form, like a like a gelatin paste form, and export it to Europe to these ayahuasca groups, different ayahuasca groups, and um, it's become like a you know, it, in some places it can even become rare because it's being cut down too much. So there's a there's even ecological threat to the to the sustainability if it's used in a in a you know in a in an exploitative way, without without taking care of the the sustainability, and then and then there's also you know also depending on the country, ayahuasca has it's in a dubious legal status in a lot of countries. In the United States, it's it there was a Supreme Court case in the late 2000s, sort of like peyote, where ayahuasca was 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 um, legalized for religious use, but in a lot of European countries, it's not like in France. Um, there have been in France and Spain, there have been in Legitimate indigenous healers traveling in in Europe who've been put to, in jail because in these countries ayahuasca is considered to be a you know a, an abusive drug like like any you know, like cocaine or heroin and so there have been indigenous healers who actually been in jail for for coming to the to Europe and and doing ayahuasca sessions 
I did wonder about that, actually. I mean, because, it, as you say, we are using it in probably not in a recreational sense, but we are not, I don't think, giving it the appropriate kind of cultural significance when, when we use it in the West. So, yeah, I, I can't see that it, it can be legal, if, you know, in in the future. Well, there's, I mean, there's been several court cases and, you know, in, in, I know that in Holland, there was a, there was a, in one of these cases in the, in the European court system, someone was appealing the case of one of these, of these traditional healers who was in prison. And there was a, there was a decision in Holland, but it, it had applied to the European Union that would, that, that understood ayahuasca not as a drug, but as a religious, you know, as a religious substance, which it is. Um, but then, like you said, are these uses, you know, in these other contexts, are they really religious or are they more therapeutic or are they more recreational? The, 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 the distinctions become blurred. And so there was there was an initial opinion that it shouldn't be considered a drug because of this because of this context. But then and more recently, you know, th- those those interpretations change. And more, more recently, more recently, that interpretation has been questioned, especially in France, where, where the, the French legal system is much more strict about about uh, about any sort of well, they're strict about cult, drugs, but French cult, French legal system is very um, very punitive of what they consider religious cults. Anything that smacks of being a religious cult can be very persecuted. And so, some of these ayahuasca religions from Brazil are treated as cults and and uh, and not uh, cults in in France rather than as religions. Mm, interesting. So it's it's a, sort of a whole can of worms when you know when it le- it leaves its traditional context, its traditional use patterns. Um, goes into the Western world of commerce and psychotherapy and and alternative therapy and and there's even people in Europe and elsewhere who have found other plants or pharmacological substances that have it's sort of the same mixture as ayahuasca chemically speaking but it's not the same plant and they create these new pharmacological potions of ayahuasca and the the traditional healers from amazon say that's not if it's not made with these two plants it's not ayahuasca Mm. and yet these other users say well we can take these two other plants um uh from other parts of the world that that aren't you know not from the amazon you can take other plants that have the same chemical components and boil them down and create something with the same chemical structure is that the same thing or not and that's you know that's another it's a it's a difficult question to answer just because you have the same chemical substance and the way the indigenous people understand it, ayahuasca and the various plants you mix with it, mix with it, they're living beings who who confer their intelligence and power to the person who consumes them. Whereas if you just take the pure chemical substances and mix them, that would no longer be a sacred substance. Whereas some people say, well, it gives the same effect. That's considered to be a legitimate use too. So there's there's all these questions that have opened up as ayahuasca has exp- expanded and and commercialized throughout the world. Mm, yeah, because it, as you say, the plant is part of the experience, and when you take it out of that context, it it makes me wonder because it's very specific to a place, and obviously, if you're from that place, I suspect you would have a different experience of ayahuasca than somebody who was um, using it in in say the UK. Um, and it might be a silly question, but has anybody actually documented the differences in experiences that people have um, when they take ayahuasca? If you know, dependent on their culture. Well, there actually, I mean, uh, there there's been a study. It's been questioned a lot, but there was a study by a, an Israeli um, psych, psychiatrist or psychologist. Uh, ben, uh, I think his name is Ben Benny Sharon, and he 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 gave ayahuasca. He 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 studied people who non you know non indigenous peoples Europeans um, who would take an ayahuasca. And he he documented their basically their visions and their feelings, things that they thought. And he sort of categorized the visions, and and he documented a number of what he considers to be universal patterns, um, many of which match up with some of the things that indigenous people talk about. Seeing you know seeing jaguars, tigers, you know feline uh, animals, seeing forests, trees, um, nature nature spirits, um, you know. A sensation of vines growing. Anyway, he he did a study where, he, in his his in his interpretation, although there are a lot of cultural variations, he he considered that there were certain core elements of the ayahuasca vis, visionary experience that transcend the cultures. It's you know it, it's it's a somewhat subjective uh, uh, study, and people have criticized it for being overly 
generalizing, but there it, it's a very it's a very interesting study mm. showing that there do seem to be some um, core elements that 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 you you see across cultures, even people who aren't from the Amazon, that seem to reflect some of the things that Amazonian people talk about. It's, it's an interesting study. Mm, it sounds fascinating. Um, have you have you done it yourself? Oh yeah, many times, many yeah. times. <laughs> and would you recommend people try it, or would you say that's very dependent on on who they are and where they are? Well, I, I, I'd say, I mean, you know, when I first heard about ayahuasca, I really wanted to, I, I got to take this stuff. I went to the Amazon, I got to find this stuff. And, um, and, and my first experience was actually very bad um, because I just sort of, whatever the first chance I had, I got to take this stuff and I did it and it was a very bad experience. And then I didn't take it for a long time until, again, until I found a context where I felt much more comfortable with the people in, in sort of a, you know, I, I took it in one of these more commercial kind of context in a, in, a, in, a, in a more urban area, and it was just a really bad experience. And then years later, I was working with the Machinga Indians, and they, they said they didn't take it anymore, but they did take it. They just weren't telling it to me. And so finally, when they involved me in their rituals, then I discovered something very positive and very, and very wonderful, actually. And so I guess I'd say that, um, you know, you definitely want to, you don't want to go out and find it. You want to let it find you in a way. I mean, don't sort of go out and take sort of go out and take the first charlatan who's selling it on the corner you kind of want you want to be in a context where you feel comfortable and at ease and with people that you trust and know and then it can be a very positive experience it's it's every time is different it's it, there's no there's no sort of universal every single time is very different and it can be very tough and very you know it can be very um, challenging and it can be very wonderful it's, it's, it's very different but d- definitely it's something you know something to be reckoned with it's 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 no fun I, I, it's not a, it's not a fun thing to take but it definitely um, I mean the indigenous people say it's kind of like the university you, know, you go to the university for one day what do you learn you know but if you keep going back to it it opens up a way of knowing the world that's very different from our western way of knowing the world that that can be very enriching to a life yeah, I can tell speaking to you that I, you know, I just have, I think I'm quite open minded, but obviously I, I'm just so ingrained in that kind of Western way of thinking that, you know, you don't realize, you don't realize day to day how much you, you kind of take everything on board and, and express that in every day of your life. Um, well, thank you very much for speaking to me. And I, I will probably, you know, I'll let you go now because I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours. Um, but before you go, I'm, I'm, I just wondered how things were going. We were kind of all out in the streets over here, over the rainforest burning. Um, is, are you kind of okay where you are? Is it, is it as horrendous as the media are making out? It's, I mean, it's pretty bad. It's, it's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not in the place that is burning right now. I'm, I'm in Europe right now, but I, mm. I just left Brazil. But um, it's definitely, you know, the, the, the burning has gotten worse from last year. And, and I think it's definitely, there's been a, there's been a response to the new president. The, the Brazilian president has sort of let it, let it be known in his public statements. He's not going to enforce the law. And so a lot of lawless people are out there. I remember the very first day, the, the very first day he was elected in Manaus, the morning after his election, the whole city was covered in smoke because just people went out and burned forests just mm-hmm. to show that they could. Yeah. And so the, 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 that, that was just one day after his election, just, just, just joy burners just went out and started burning. And the whole city was covered in smoke that first day. And this is now, you know, this is now um, – the dry season when people are, are doing doing agriculture and there's just a sense of lawlessness and impunity. People know, well, he's, you know, he's, he's sort of turned a blind eye. He's, he's, you know, mining, illegal mining has gone, has gone rampant. You know, illegal logging is rampant. Invasion of indigenous lands is rampant. And now this burning, he, when, when the, when the Brazil's NASA, Brazil's space agency alerted the country, you know, our satellites have shown that, you know, forest burning is up by, you know, almost three times what it was during the same period last year. And the, his environmental minister said, that's not true. That's not true. And he said, and, and he was fired. And the, when, when, the, when the head of the Brazilian Space Agency responded to this ludicrous anti-scientific uh, charge that the satellite, I and mean, he says, yes, it is true. <laughs> These are the facts. He was fired. He lost his job. Mm. So there's a, there's a sense of, you know, denial of scientific facts and, uh, and, and, and rhetoric that inflames the, you know the most racist people in the country, and uh, and and the miners and the loggers and the and the farmers who are cutting forests down, they 
they know that they're not going to be punished, and so they're just taking advantage of the, when this government that denies facts and uh, and 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 incentivizes people to break the law because he's. I mean, all this stuff that's being done is is illegal. It's it's. I mean, these fires are illegal. The gold mining is illegal. It, invading indigenous lands is illegal. The logging that's being done is illegal. But there's a sense that you know the government is turning a blind eye and even incentivizing people to do this, and uh, and people are doing it, and so you know words have consequences. So, so, but it seems like there's been a very strong international reaction, and he's he's kind of backpedaled from some of his most extreme statements. He's being, you know, people are in in Europe are threatening to stop buying Brazilian beef because of the the impacts, and so it, it seems like his his words have come back to bite him. We'll see. We'll see if the international pressure keeps up. That's that's really important. The international pressure is very important because Brazil depends on its exports. Hmm. And the, the, what's fueling all this is, you know, exporting soybeans, exporting beef. And if people can, you know, put pressure and boycott and, uh, you know, uh, and push back against this, then that does actually have an impact. Uh, there was I just saw a statistic that, you know, of all the fires, you know, there are, these fires are affecting something like 150 different indigenous territories that are being affected by these fires, and the logging and the, go- and the illegal mining is directly impacting indigenous peoples. So it's, you know, it's um, in addition to hurting by, bi- you know, the global, you know, global climate and global biodiversity, it's directly affecting indigenous peoples in Brazil. So it's a very relevant question to ask. And I hope you didn't mind me asking that question. I know this episode was slightly longer than normal. But I thought it was a great opportunity to get a perspective on the situation from inside Brazil. And you and Glenn are both lucky it didn't run any longer because I could have spoken to him for hours. I've put links in the show notes to where you can find Glenn online. And I think you'll find his blog a great read, so do check that out. As always, thank you for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content, plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.